man who has taken time to holistically give himself to the word of God has not proved it that it works. The word of God cannot fail because this is the absoluteness of his power. An open invitation to a life in the word. Because you have received the faith of Christ and you have embraced the righteousness of God through faith. Grace and peace are multiplied. That is why we lay hands on the lame and they walk. We lay hands on the blind and they see. We lay hands on the deaf and they hear. It's powerful enough to give you the answer on its first application. Arise on the wings of revelation. Align your destiny. Transform your world. This is Fenero Make Manifest with Apostle Grace Lubega. Lumiza. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for today. Thank you for our lives. Thank you for keeping us. Thank you for leading us. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for preserving us. Thank you for gathering us. Thank you for providing for us. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah! Happy Palm Sunday! If you came with the palms, I want you to wave them, wave them, wave them. Those of you who didn't, just wave your hands like this. Yay! You may take your seats. Greet your neighbor on the left and on the right, even if they're your wife. This time, treat them like a church member. Tell them, how are you? How is life? How are the people in the overflow? Those are my most beloved children. They're in the overflow. My favorite children. My last bones. The ones I give everything they want. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. While we're preparing for men gather. Uh, 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 uh. We're preparing for men gather. A woo, yeah. A, a lady has done a woo. She's looking away, but I've seen you. She did like a woo. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 20th April, men mobilize, 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 mobilize. It's going to be the most memorable men's conference. Listen, the world is going to tune in to see. They won't believe what they're going to see. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So write a list of your 10 people and then book them early. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, allow me to bless our offerings this afternoon. Heavenly Father, we bless you for the generosity of your people. The Bible says you give seed to the soul and bread to the eater. We can only give as far as you've given us. And out of the abundance of what you've given us, cognizant that it is yours. We only give back knowing we can never outgive you because you own all things. But you're testing our hearts against 
what you have given. And these men and women, Lord, have been faithful. Continue to make them more effective and efficient in whatever needs to be done for the kingdom. Wealth is yours. Victory is yours. Health is yours. In Jesus' mighty name, and all saints said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Are you ready for the word? I'm preaching a sermon this afternoon entitled, Looking Unto Jesus. Turn to your neighbor on the left and tell them, I'm looking unto Jesus. Turn to your neighbor on the right and tell them, I'm looking unto Jesus. Hallelujah, glory to God. And the text that we're going to uh, derive our narrative this afternoon comes from a very famous scripture in, I mean, famous story in Numbers 21, but before I even get to that story, I wanted to give us foundation for us to appreciate what God is telling us this afternoon. Of course, we begin with the place where the children of Israel have now crossed from Egypt. The sea has been parted, and now they're through the wilderness as God would want it to be a short journey. As the scripture says that when the children of Israel were delivered, from Egypt, the Bible says they did not go through the way of the Philistines, although that was near, Exodus 13, verse 17. For the Bible says that God said, least but adventure, the people repent when they see war and return to Egypt. And as I've already said this, those of you who have been in this ministry for quite some time, um, it would have taken probably a 14-day 14 journey, 14 journey, but because they were not ready, the fear in them and the many other things uh, that needed to be constructed in the identity that had been enslaved for uh, a ton of decades, God had to take them through a longer route. And so they had to go place to place. And that's why they spent 40 years in the wilderness that they were supposed to spend 14 days for. Now, in one of those expeditions, the king, Arad, which was Canaanite, dwelt in the south. And he had tell that the Israelites came by the way, or Israel came by the way of spies. And then he wages war against Israel and takes some of their prisoners. And then by the leading of Moses, Israel vows a vow unto the Lord and says, if you will indeed deliver these people into my hand, this is the Canaanites, then I will utterly destroy their cities. The scriptures tell us the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. And he called the name of the place, that is Israel, or, or by the leading of Moses, God calls the name of the place Homer. Are we clear to that extent? They've just received the victory. But there's a point I want to give us there. And after that victory in the fourth verse, they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. So yes, they carry fear. They're indifferent to the way of the spirit. They don't yet have a spiritual tenacity to withstand the Philistines. They have to go a longer journey, which is a 40-year journey. And so they have to move place to place. This movement, God is teaching them. He's dealing with them. He's constructing the right attitude, character. He's maturing them to the place of being able to take over the promised land one day. But now one of those days they are taking a route by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom, which later we learn in text that they spent 40 years of the 42 years around one area, the territory of the Edomites, Mount Seir, the children of Esau. Anyway, so they're discouraged because of the way. The way is so long, they're tired. And because of that, the people, the Bible says, verses 5, spake against God and against Moses, saying, Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Why, in simpler English, did you bring us up out of Egypt into the wilderness to kill us? Why? Why? They said, For there is no bread neither is there any water, and our soul 
loveth this light bread. Or in simpler English, if you read in the Amplified Version, it will help some of us uh, catch up with what he's saying. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. We loath this light, contemptible, unsubstantial manner. They hated what God was feeding them with. But let's go up to make the point. I've not yet uh, touched the subject matter, but there's something for us here to take home. God has just set the Israelites free from the hand of him who was mightier, Pharaoh. From years of slavery, he has parted the seas. They've seen a miracle that had never been seen in human history. He sees that they've crossed over, but they don't have food. They've not planted any seeds in the wilderness. It's a dry place. But that's the journey they have to go through to get into the promised land. It is supposed to be a two weeks journey. So the provision in the wilderness, whatever it was, manner which he gives them, this was supposed to only be eaten by the Israelites for only two weeks at most, and then they would enter the promised land and eat whatever they're supposed to be eating. But because of their indifference, they don't know or understand the heart of God in this. And there are two things here. I'll come to that. They don't understand the heart of God in why he feeds them with what he feeds them, leads them the way he leads them. And the Bible says he led them not. That means even in the 40 days, 40 years, sorry, in the wilderness, in their indifference and fear, God was still willing to lead them according to what they are able to handle because God cannot give you more than you are able that is why maturity is an important aspect of the Christian faith. Because as you continue to grow, God empowers and entrusts you with bigger. If you're still young, he won't give you much, right? Parents understand this. You can't get your seven-year-old kid and tell them, sit behind the wheel and drive. That would be irresponsible. Because that child has not yet matured enough to understand how to go on the road. Because in driving, in in in, in in the, in the trainings we have had of some of you, of course, some of you, you, you just got a car and moved it. So, you're, you're driving by grace. Can you drive? Yes. Actually, many people know how to move cars. Very few people know how to drive. You find somebody, they're 10 years driving, 15 years driving, and then you ask them, what is defensive driving? And they don't know. But they've been driving for 10 to 15 years. So you're moving a car. Now those of us who learned to drive when cars were still manual. We are the ones who understand the car. The newer generation is driving bumper cars. Drive. Whee! Accelerator. Brake. Accelerator. Brake. But those people who remember the joy of a clutch. <laughs> Balancing a car on the hill with only the accelerator and the clutch. Ah, yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> then there are those who are saying, what is he talking about? <laughs> I just wanted to make you laugh. But back to what I was trying to say. There are two things here that are important to note. First thing is, this God has just parted seas, separated, I mean, uh, delivered them from the hand of Pharaoh. And they've just started walking a journey, which is their fault that while they were still in Egypt, at one point, the Bible says they had increased in number, more than the Egyptians. At one point, the Jews were more in number more than the Egyptians. At one point, the Jews were stronger than the Egyptians. And at one point, the Jews were richer than the Egyptians. But they did not take advantage of their strengths to preserve, 
to consolidate themselves in the land of Egypt. Scriptures are clear in Exodus chapter 7 as Pharaoh testified the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty and the land was filled with them. Later Pharaoh as well says, these people now have become more in number. This is now Pharaoh speaking. They've become more in number. They've become stronger than this. If we don't tempt them, yes, the ninth verse down there. It says, behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. This is Pharaoh testifying that the children of Israel are mightier than we are. They are more than us. Now, how can a people more in number, mightier than you, with a stronger covenant than you, be taken into bondage? That's for another day. Because I have a someone there on, uh, especially on the wisdom of building a nation. How can a stronger, mightier people, more in number, be taken into captivity by a less number, weaker number? And here, the ingredient, missing ingredient here is wisdom. The Egyptian knew how to run a nation more than the Jew. This is deep, but that's for another day. That's for another day. So it's their fault. It's their fault. But look here, they're still blaming God. Now he has parted the seas for you, delivered you from the hand of Pharaoh. You're going through the wilderness, the first point. You have been given victory over the Canaanite. And just a few steps through the wilderness, they are already speaking against God and Moses. And this is for truth. That's human beings. Some of you, as you continue to grow, you will realize that human beings are exactly like that. And some of you are paying the full price of having invested and done good for people who now either have turned against you or hardly recognize your contribution in their lives. I watched a video a couple of weeks ago and this person was standing before the camera saying, I'm done with helping people. Any of you who thought you were coming to me, this, probably this person was a philanthropist. And so they used to give, help the poor, help the sick, distressed and disadvantaged in society. So they were known for being a giver. And I think some of the people who were giving turned against them. And this person says, I'm done with helping people. People are wicked. I'll keep my money and eat it with my children and die. And some of you are at that level. Because you are disappointed like God and Moses was. The very people God has rescued in slavery, parted seas for, given food, given everything they need, given them victory over their enemies, they can still murmur because the journey is longer, which is, as scripture has showed, their fault. A child is an orphan, and some of you are, which is not your fault. When your parents died, which I sympathize with, or denounced you for some reason, by all means, you could have found yourself on the streets, eating in the dumpster. See? Somebody brings you into their home. Become your guardian. Either they are probably your auntie or your uncle who owes you nothing because you're not their biological child. Well, some of you, the people in that house are not related to you by blood, but out of their own generosity, open their door to welcome you into their own home. And yes, because they're human beings, they're imperfect. You're probably going to feel like you're the fifth wheel on the car, if you know what I mean. Because maybe they had planned for their four children to build a house, you're the fifth child. And maybe they might give you the boys' quarters to sleep because you were not in their plan. But even the generosity 
to extend love to you and give you that room. You might not live like their children, but at least they have considered to give you that room. You get it? They might not take you to the schools their children were taken. Maybe because it's who they are, they're also learning. But appreciate that little they've extended to give you at least a school that might not be equal to what their children go to. But at least you are in school because the other option you had was going on the streets and not having a life. And then you find this child complaining. My guardian, when they eat meat, they give me beans. Huh? They give their children pocket money of 100,000 and they give me 10,000. That's between them and God. But I want you to remember, they owe you nothing. They owe you nothing. I know a child once who was taken from their mother, were taken to a stepmother. And this child is complaining, my stepmother does not buy me good clothes. Are you sick? Why isn't your mother the one buying you clothes? If your stepmother can give you clothes that are not as expensive, but your mother can't give you, who is better? Are you seeing what I'm saying? And some mothers are not wise. That's the mother who will go and say, my child is suffering. Then you ask them, if they give you back this child, are you going to take them to school? No, I don't have fees. Then keep quiet. Do you get it? I know I'm offending some of you. But that's what truth does. You're just in its way. You just found yourself in the way of truth. So it knocked you. Not Apostle Grace. Do you get what I'm trying to tell you? Go through the worst circumstances and study. Promising yourself that one day will make it. And usually such children make it. If they are wise. If they appreciate what God is trying to do for them. But then, you find that same person speaking against you. <laughs> Who extended your hand to give whatever you were able to give? How do they know what you had? You are not in another person's plan. This mother should have told her child, I don't care whether you have no clothes on your head, on your body, if you can have an education in that house, study. Isn't it? Because that's what was necessary. But you guardian who is like looking after that child, I have a message for you here. Don't help people expecting anything from them. expect from God and only God. Otherwise, you stop helping people. You'll be disappointed in who they are. These are fallen Adamic. They can even speak against the God who gives them a breath. They can speak against this God who keeps their kidneys working. Human beings are like that. I'm done with God. Why did I ask him for a car? He didn't give it to me. But that car probably was going to kill you on Sunday. It's just how human beings are. The Bible says in Luke 6, 35, love your enemies, those who set themselves against you in spite of your hand of love. He says, be kind and do good. Amplified version. Doing favors, listen, so that someone derives benefit from them and learn to them. Expecting, read your Bible. Expecting, Luke 6, 35, expecting and hope for nothing in return but considering nothing as lost and despairing of no one. They might never appreciate you. Keep giving. Because the Bible is clear. Not all the seeds we are sowing we shall receive in this life. Some of the seeds you are sowing your children and children's children will receive. Some of the seeds that you are sowing you have a reward for in heaven. The Bible speaks of do not lay up treasures in places where the moths can eat and the thief can steal. But lay up treasures, the Bible says in, in Matthew 6, 19, now in 6, 20, lay up yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, nor thieves 
can break through to steal. There are things we are doing that only heaven will repay. Some of you, the things we are doing for you as your pastors, you might never appreciate. You might never understand. So me, I don't go, oh, this person I told them for years, they've turned against me. My reward is with God. He knows the sacrifices. He knows our hearts. He knows our investment in your lives. I don't say, oh, I will never help people. Mm -mm. Keep doing what you have to. They'll see it through my children, my children's children. Even when we reach in heaven, you'll see my, my chair. To be bigger. You see what I'm saying? That's the attitude you must have. Don't help people expecting anything from them. Oh, I helped this sister. How come she has not helped me? Don't expect help from them. Once you extend your hand of mercy to a person, wait on God and expect only from God. The Bible says, my expectation is from him. Of him, from him. That's what the Bible says. Don't expect from man. Keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. Not everybody will appreciate, but expect from him only. Psalm 62 verses 5. My soul, wait thou only upon the people I helped. Is that what the Bible says? Uh-uh. Is that what the Bible says? Wait upon only on God. For my expectation is from him. Only God can reward you of your seed of love. They're here murmuring. They're here murmuring. But God will do everything to draw them. They are weak, but he'll do everything to still love them out. Don't give up on people. They might be crazy. All you, you just keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. Eventually, God knows what to do at the end. But the other second point is, he's taking them through the wilderness because... Oh, he's giving them manna because he doesn't want to make them comfortable in what's not inheritance. You get it? In what's not what? Inheritance. Otherwise, they will not aspire to transcend to where God wants them to be. I'll give you an example. Imagine there's a thief out there, okay? And he's stealing for food. He's on the streets begging. He's probably eating the crumbs that people throw of food. He's depraved. Or even the basic necessities of life. Then he breaks through a supermarket or somebody's house to steal and he is arrested. And on arrest, this prisoner is taken into a prison cell somewhere or a prison, a general prison. He enters his cell. Ding, 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 ding. The dove lunch comes through. And then lunch time. They serve him with three pieces of chicken, two pieces of pork, some saffron rice, a salad, barbecue sauce, a classic lemonade, for lunch. Then he eats lunch. Then in the evening, they get him some goat ribs. Well fried with all condiment and herb. With a very nice olive oil. And some nice uh, plantain and some milk tea, rich in all protein. And then tomorrow morning, they get him a freshly caught nail patch. Back in the oven for about a couple of hours, comes out simmering with some fried fries on the side. Okay? This is a thief. Then, 
he gains weight. Every time he's belching because he's eating good. Then after six months, they tell him, you're free to go. <laughs> Did you get it? That guy will be like, hmm? where are many? Where are many? Am I going back to his bag? He's going to find a way to go back in one prison. That is why when a man is being fed right, if you can feed a man right, it doesn't matter what slavery you put them in, they can stay slaves for decades, till their life, till the end of their lives. That's what the Egyptians knew. These children of Israel are under forced labor and they are enslaved by the hand of Pharaoh. But they make sure they eat fish. They eat cucumber, watermelon, broccoli. If you remember their complaints, we remember the fish we ate for free. Numbers 11 verses 5. He says, we ate fish. You read it in the, English, in the message version. You love it in the message version. This is them now testifying. We ate fish in Egypt. Hey. And got it what? To say nothing of the cucumbers and melons, the leeks and onions and garlic. But nothing tastes good out here. All we get is manna, manna. And this is a spiritual warning. If you're that kind of person out there watching me or sitting in this room and you derive pleasure, satisfaction in how you eat and what you eat, then it doesn't matter whether you see the shackles on your feet or not, you are enslaved. Food is your God. It's your to-go-to -to place. It's your personal person. It's the thing that understands you. Fire. I said fire. The Bible says their end is in destruction. Whose God, whose God is their belly. That's how the children of Israel had been the best. Food should not be your God. If God says eat one meal, the same food every day, he's trying to tell you don't be comfortable. This is not where you are supposed to be. You get it? But they would carry offense. They would carry offense. Why are you feeding me with this? God is telling you this is not your place. That's why he fed them with money every day. And besides, you're not digging it. You're not plowing for it. What's the big deal? The thing fall down and you eat. But you're even quarreling of what you've not dug. What you've not cooked. Bigger picture. I want to make you a nation. Don't be petty. In that maturity, you learn to pay the prices that come with the inconveniences that require your maturations. And some of those things are okay. And some of you, that maturity might mean to get out of that house you were living with that man unmarried and look for a one-roomed house. That's your manner. And you say, eh, how can I live in this one-room house? Me? And you shake your neck like me? You'd rather prefer a mansion, but with a shameful glory. No. Choose God. Tell anybody but choose God. I know my daughters here who chose border borders, not because there's no fellow we willing to buy you a GLS 63, a G class, but because you said, mm -hmm. let me wait for the right one. Let me wait for the right one. Are you following what I'm saying? I can't tell you how many offers some of us got to leave this country because there are people who felt that our nation was not appreciating our gift. <laughs> Temptation. But you say, mm, let me stay in that dusty country. 
See what the Lord has done. Did it did it did it and see what the Lord has done. And what we waited for has come to us. See you. Now, they are flying into Uganda. They fly in every week to receive what's happening here. Be patient. Tell your neighbor, be patient. Your story is turning soon. Glory to God. But yet, I've not even yet started preaching what I'm supposed to teach. <laughs> now, here's the sermon. Anyway, so God wants to teach them a lesson. The Lord sent fairy serpents, now we start the text, among the people, and they beat the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, when he prayed for the people, Make thee a fairy serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is beaten, when he looketh upon it, he shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent, if a serpent had beaten any man, when he beheld a serpent of brass, he lived. And when that happened, the Bible says in the next verse, the children of Israel set forward. The children of Israel set forward. Now that last sentence, set forward, is about to become so important for you. Let's go back to this. Many of us know this text. Many of us have a clue about what this means. I'm going to show you something perhaps you have never seen in the degree that you should see. In the New Testament, God gives us meaning of this. And he says in John chapter 3, verses 14, he says, and Moses lift, and as Moses, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, in the times of trial for man, even so, must, not may or could, he says, must the son of man be lifted up that whosoever, whosoever, that does not exclude any man listening to me regardless of where you are, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Whosoever. Whosoever. Now let's go back in that context so I can help you understand this. If you are somewhere, believing Christian, and a serpent bites somebody who is also a Christian, what's usually the first thing we should do? First aid. You're going to have to look for a black stone. Isn't it? Then we can speak in tongues. And that's what many Christians do. The serpent bites, pa, and then they start. Where's the black stone? First tie. And then they tie, black stone, put it there. Then after that, there is, shikara ba 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 shikara ba 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 Isn't it? I'm going to tell you a story that I have seen with my own eyes. It's a man of God now serving God, I think, for close to 30 years. I know him personally. I met him when I was a little child. He's still serving God. He's an army man. One of those days, he's in the bush with his friends. They are fighting, I think, the corny rebels. And a serpent from a tree, poisonous beast, comes and strikes him. He's a born-again Christian. And then he tells them, the life of God in me cannot allow this poison to kill me. I will not die. Everybody looks at this man 
and says, you're going to die. He says, I am not going to die. He says, by a couple of few hours later, he starts swelling up. The poison is moving in his body. And he kept saying, I cannot die. I cannot die. I cannot die. To go to sleep, I think some people are watching to see whether this man has lost pulse. Next morning, he stands up as if he had never been stricken by anything. This testimony has been so big on his life. In fact, it's what bats his ministry. He's moved nation testifying about this. This man did not die on a poisonous snake because he believed the scripture that says that you shall trample on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Any means. How many of us believe it? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Today I want to provoke our faith. I said I want to provoke somebody's faith. Let me share a mystery with you. When you study the Hebrew, this sacred language from where your text, your Old Testament is written, and the New Greek is written, there are two words that I think I need to teach you today. One of the words is called Malvet. It's a Hebrew word called Malvet. When you go in the, in, in the original text Hebrew, which then you write your English, Malvet in English is death. Death. Death in the sacred language, Malvet, is actually a singular word. In other words, it's a finite thing. In other words, it has an end. In other words, Malvet in that language is not forever. In essence, the Hebrew understands when we say death is not permanent. Nothing dead is permanent. Me dead. Nothing touching death has an infinite bearing. It's finite. This is important for you to understand. But there's also another word called Kaim. And Kaim means life. But when you study that word Kaim, life, it's actually plural. In other words, the Hebrew would call it lives because it's infinite, it's endless. It means death in any nature or form has an end and it's finite. But life in its divine essence is endless and eternal. It means nothing dead is permanently dead. Yet for whatever God has given, life is forever a life. Do you get it? Do you understand this meaning? Martha comes to Jesus Christ and tells him, my brother, no, let's go back to the story of Lazarus. God says, they send for Jesus. A message to Jesus, Martha and Mary. They send a message to Jesus. And they said, whom, he whom thou lovest is sick. The one you love is sick. Follow this, your smart students. Jesus says, Lazarus' sickness is not unto death. Why is he saying it? Because he's the word. Jesus is the word. The word has spoken. Lazarus' sickness is not unto death. Are you getting it? 
but that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. When it is spoken, Lazarus dies, according to men. Jesus didn't rush to say, let me go and pray before the man dies. No. He has not recognized death as a final thing. Because he is life and the resurrection. He has not recognized death. He refused to recognize Lazarus' death. The world says Lazarus is dead. Jesus is saying Lazarus is not dead. Lazarus is dead. They put him in the tomb four days. Jesus is saying Lazarus is not dead. So after four days, people are crying. The world is screaming. They're all lopping, acting pain. And then as Martha hears the rumor that Jesus is coming, she goes to reach out to him. When she reaches him, she says, if you were here, my brother would not have what? Died. Jesus says in the next verse, he saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping, which came with him. He groaned in the spirit and he was troubled, right? And he said, no, no, no. Before that, we're talking about him talking to Martha where he tells her, I am the resurrection. It's 24. When Martha comes to him, she tells him, because Mary said it too, but Martha said it before in 11, Mark 11, 24. John 11, 24. He said unto him, she said unto him, oh, before that, verses 20, is it verses 20? John 11, 21, yes. John 11, 21. Martha tells Jesus, if you had been here, my brother had not died. He would not have died. The next verse, 22, but I know that even now, whatsoever you ask of the Lord, God will give it to thee. Verses 23, Jesus said, thy brother shall rise again, right? Now he's talking to her in her world. Yeah, he's getting to where she is. That's not where he is. For him, he doesn't recognize that death. Then he tells her, I am the resurrection and the life. Because she tells him, I know he shall rise on the day of resurrection. Then she says, uh -uh, woman, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though in your world he were dead, yet shall he live in my world. You see, at that point, if you had had Jesus speak and Lazarus died in your world, you'd actually say this prophet is a lie. Because he said, Jesus, Jesus said that Lazarus' sickness shall not be unto death. But look here, you are saying that he's dead. But he said it shall not be unto death. So who of the two is lying? The giver of life refused to recognize the death of Lazarus. But the world did. So he gets to Martha and tells her, oh, okay, if you say he's dead, he shall rise. Oh no, Martha says, I know he shall rise on the day of the resurrection, that last day when all of us rise. He says, no. I am the resurrection and I am the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Now you see Jesus saddened, later on crying, weeping. And the Bible says, and they that observe him say, oh, see how he loved him. But that's their opinion. Jesus is not weeping because of Lazarus' death. Because would it make sense for Jesus to weep over a man he has not recognized as dead and whom he has the power to raise. So he was not crying over Lazarus. He was crying over them because he recognized their indifference. And after crying, he said, where have you laid him? After weeping, he said, where have you left, put him? They take him to the tomb, to the grave. And the Bible says, take away the stone. He doesn't say, Lazarus, rise up from the dead. 
he says, Lazarus, come forth. But remember at one point, he thanks the Lord because he hears his prayer. Because I feel in my spirit, he groans when he sees people crying. He groans because they don't understand the heart of God. Help them understand what I was saying. You get it? Help them connect to where I'm at. They see a man in the tomb four days, but I see that this is for the glorification of the Son of God. This man's sickness is not unto death. This is not death. I am the resurrection. He has spoken. He says, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible says, Lazarus comes out in grave clothes with a napkin, napkin covering his face. He says, loose him and let him go. Do you see from where? So in our world, we say, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. But in the world of God, Lazarus wasn't dead. His life was still in him. He didn't call back Lazarus' spirit from heaven back into the body. His life was still in him. He was still waiting. The, the, the life in Lazarus could only be activated even as it was there dormant by a man of faith. That is why if you remember the story of Eutychus, this young man Paul is teaching and, and then he falls off a building and the Bible says he was taken up dead. Now that's them saying Eutychus was dead. Paul lays over this young man. And after some time, he says, do not be troubled. His life is in him. His life is in him. He might have no pulse, have had no pulse, but he had not left the body. He's still in there. The principle of life is still active in this young man. I just need to hold him and activate it. Because I'm the resurrection and the life. He refused to consider what everyone regarded. Are you following what I'm saying? This is important. This is very important. I pray you don't lose this in everything you learn today. Don't lose that this young man was dead to the people. But when Paul holds him, the young man's life is in him. He didn't say the life has returned back. He didn't use the language, his life has returned back. He told them, do not trouble yourself. His life is in him. In one version he says, don't worry, he's alive. But he's talking to a corpse. And the scriptures tell us, and the young man came up and they took him home. But Paul had to see him alive, even though to the people he was dead. In fact, the Bible says he came up unhurt, unharmed and went back home. You could have said that from that fall, surely, what killed him must have cracked his bones or his head, his, his skull. And perhaps there must have been a, an internal bleeding or a crack or somewhere, a broken bone or something like that. But when he connects to this young man's spirit, he goes back unhurt. That means the life, the principle of life in Paul, resurrected, no, sorry, activated life to connect to what was already in this young man. Because he, could not, he did not recognize or regard this young man as dead. Are you following what I'm saying? His life is still within him. It's not his time to leave his body yet. I can tell you we've buried many people who are still alive. Who has understood this? I think we have buried people whose life was still in there. We just needed to believe God longer. Some of you know the story of a famous musician in this country. Some of you were there in La Bonita. He brought his brother who was born with HIV. Both parents had died with HIV. So he brings him for me. I get this young man, hug him. And the principle of life is activated. And I tell his brother, go back and check this boy. They took the same boy back to the doctors. They can't trace HIV. You get it? Because 
the principle of life in me believes that that young man is alive, even though the machines were saying that there was death in his blood. You people should not underestimate the power of God in you. Tell your neighbor, don't take for granted what God has put inside you. This is not for Apostle Grace only, okay? It's not for few special men, but it's for those who have chosen to believe. That is why in the story of Christ, when he's at the cross, the Bible says, he gave up the ghost. He gave up his spirit. He could not die. Do you get it? There was no death in him. Jesus could not die. When he had received vinegar, he said it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the spirit. The spirit didn't leave him. He gave it up. He said, it's the only way this body. It's the only way this body can, can stop breathing. I need to give up the spirit. If the spirit had stayed in that body, Jesus would not die. You get it? That is why the Bible speaks of how death could not hold or had no hold on him. Acts 2.24. It says, let's read it. Whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. It was not possible for death to hold Christ. Now, some of you, when you say Jesus is in me, it means that the principle of life is inside your body. Do you understand what I'm saying? The principle of life is inside your body. Lazarus' sickness shall not end in two deaths. But I can come to your liver and say, okay, he shall raise her. Because that's what you understand. But Jesus walks to that tomb, that grave, sure that if he calls Lazarus, the life in him will hear and come back. He didn't rebuke a spirit of death. He just called back a man whom he knew had not died. According to the realm of heaven. He called back whom he knew is not dead. Are you following what I'm saying? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Not looking at the prevailing circumstances. Not considering what you're going through. But looking unto Jesus. The author and finisher of our faith. Read that in the Amplified Version. Is it the Amplified or the Message? Message. The Message Version. One, two, three, let's go. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Study how he did it. Because he never lost sight of where he was. He had a fixed vision in spite of whatever was happening. He had a fixed sight, a fixed vision of whatever was happening. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20, 
He says, my son, attend to my words. Who is the one? Answer me, who is the one? My son, attend to my words. Incline your ear up unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For these words are life to them that find them and health to all their flesh. Let me give you a key. I tell people, whenever I find myself in some sort of trouble, I know where to look. There are times you have heard or have felt something in my body that is not supposed to be there. If I call anything or anybody or drink anything, the first thing is I turn my eyes. I look. I look at the Bible. Yeah, her sight has been open. She's seen something. I look into the Word. And I look for the scriptures that support what I want to see. And I create a mental image. The Bible says, with my mind, I serve the law of God. And look at the possibilities, the infinite possibilities that are burst through faith. And adrenaline is shot in my spirit. And I start to confess. I cannot tell you how many times I've been under threat, even this ministry. funny accusations, silly words are spoken of you or written of you and you're literally putting the ministry at threat. But I remember what the Bible says of the increase of his government. I look and the peace thereof there shall be no end. Where there is no end, it means there is life. The principle of life, breathing in this ministry, cannot be brought down by a tabloid. The principle of life, breathing in this ministry, cannot be brought, up, brought down by gossip and slander. The principle of life, running this ministry cannot be brought about by the wicked, cannot be brought down by the wicked and unreasonable. Nothing can stop what God started here. So I look into this and every time they attack me hard, I buy more chairs. And then I look into Isaiah 9 verse 7. The Bible says, <laughs> let them not depart from your eyes. That means you look through that scripture and meditate. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. The author and finisher of my faith. He knew all I could have been and done in this world. Look through the 8 billion people and literally moved his fingers and said, I pick grace. Put your name. Put your name! You might have a bad story in your life, but he still picked you. You were not as righteous as the other person, but he still said, mm, I want that one. Maybe you're not as prayerful as that person, but he still chose you. I might not be as articulate. I might not carry the language and the, the vocabulary. But he still said that, that dark-skinned fellow. There is something I see in him. When God has put his hand on a person, it doesn't matter how much they go through. They still end where God wants them to be. Touch somebody on the left and tell them I didn't choose me. I didn't. But there was someone who saw all the death I could have gone through and say that's temporal. That's not permanent. I have put a principle of life in you that you shall produce fruit that should remain because you are my seed. 
Glory to God. John 15 verse 16. He says, you have not chosen me. Nancha, you have not chosen me. Gabriel, you have not chosen me. He says, I, I have chosen you and ordained you that you might could make no should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit your ministry should remain nothing can bury me nobody because i didn't choose me he saw everything i could go through and he said My choice. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Am I preaching to somebody? Oh, oh, I'm preaching to people upstairs. Those ones seem like they're hearing me. Do you get what I'm trying to tell you? When you're in trouble, don't consider the things people are saying. Don't consider the circumstances. Uh-uh set your eyes look he says let them not depart from your eyes keep them in the midst of your heart for they are life to them that find them and medicine to all their flesh now he goes down here to emphasize on the eyes the heart but he also introduces the confession aspect verses 23 same text keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life when he says keep them in your heart he says as you bring the word in he says guard it also in other words god says you are my glory that's his word right but then circumstances come in your life that disqualify you and the devil starts to say if you're God's glory, why are you like this? If you're God's glory, why are you doing this? If you're God's glory, why is this on your life, right? Then people start judging you, criticizing you, or circumstances start to question. If you're the glory of God, why are you broke? If you're the glory of God, why are you this? If you're the glory of God, why are you this? Now, this is why he says, on the exception of taking in the word, make sure you guard your heart to not let that no sense that they are speaking about you to enter your spirit. I refuse whatever they're saying about me. I choose to hold on to what God said. You get my point? This is what it means to card your heart. He says, for out of it are the issues of life. Issues of life is translated from the Hebrew as the boundaries of your life. In other words, it determines the crown of influence and how much you're able to do in, in the world. Let me give you an example. When I was a young man, God taught me how to enlarge my, ter my, 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 my tent. Huh? The Bible says, stretch your tent, do not uh, spare. He, he taught me how to enlarge my vision because the principle of life The principle of life at work in me is infinite. So I have come to the appreciation that I'm in a finite body, but in this body is an infinite spirit. You get it? That carries infinite things, the infinite realities. And let me tell you this, I'm not saying this to boast. For as long as you hear me, as long as you hear me, even if you hear me in the next 40, 50 years, I'll always teach something you've never heard. I'm not boasting. It's the truth. I connected to the infinite realities of my essence. In my world, I'm not limited. I don't see limited. Now, it's as you continue to study the word, the boundaries of your influence continue expanding. Now, people see Fanero growing every week, but I wish I can explain to them that it begins from the expansion of the borders of my heart. If you understand this as a business person, if you understand this as a career person, 
you'll be amazed how big you can do. You're seeing meetings in this country that you have never seen before in your life, or some of you even in this region. And I'm not boasting about it. I'm only trying to tell you, it's the state of my heart. I enlarge every day my spirit dreams and read speak. But some of you only understand the things we put in, but you never really take time to assess how many voices we have to keep out. Because let me tell you, if I listened to everything spoken about me, I would be dead. People can be wicked. People can be unforgiving. People can be judgmental. People can be deceived and deceptive. Because for them, they just hear one side of the story. They don't know us. And you can live with somebody all your life and they still never know you. Do you know that? It's not enough that because you're proximate to me, therefore you know what's upon my life. That is why I'm staying unpredictable to those. They think I'm here and they discover I'm bigger than that. Because, eh, eh, put your name there. Because I know who called me. The, 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 the time he called me, some people had not even thought about God seriously. You get my point? I know what he told me. And everything shall come to pass. I know it. Now, I'm trying to help somebody here. Keeping your heart means learn to put gates around your spirit to refuse the outside circumstances to define you. Regardless of what they think about you, regardless of how the world brands you, know your plea with God and your place with Him. And I can tell you, I'm at the most perfect place with God. You get my point? Most perfect place with God. You get my point? When you're one and your spirit is silenced only to focus on one God, it doesn't matter the storms on your life. This is what he says, in whatever we have spoken up here, it's important to, you know, calibrate your heart to the right bearing. And this is it. Keep your heart for out of it are the issues of life. Then he comes to this and says, on, on top of that then, put away from thee a forward mouth and perverse lips put far from thee. Don't ever allow anybody or yourself speak negative of you regardless of your circumstance. Some of you, you are in the middle of spiritual warfare and you have, you say, I'm a loser. That means you have let it in with your own mouth. You're destroying the very boundaries that you're trying to preserve and crown with influence. You can't grow, you can't expand. You allow unnecessary words to come. You're speaking unnecessary words. Oh, the Bible speaks of perverse lips put far from thee. Perverse lips here meaning the devil can speak in your ears. But look at you, you're a loser, you're old, you're not even yet married. And you're saying, you're going, now you're 45, uh-huh. You have names of all your four children, uh-huh. And then somebody says, oh, that's true. Yeah, you're gone. You're gone. You've switched your eyes and your attention from what God is saying to what the fallen oracle is speaking on your destiny. Verses 25, let your eyes look right on and let thy eyelids, eyelids sorry, look straight before thee. Ah, this is deep. In looking, he says, let your eyes look straight forward. Let me explain this. If you're on a journey, and I'm here point X and I'm going to point Y. And then as I'm walking here, Richard punches me. Disease, poverty, challenges, struggles. And then I turn to Richard and I say, Richard, why have you punched me? Huh? A poo, a poo. I've left my course, right? And Satan now studies you and realizes there are things I can do to offset her. Any day I want to get her. Some of you, he has learned the keys that take you off course. He can say, I can actually destroy this woman's destiny by her boss. 
let me make him so overbearing that every time she's about to connect to something, something happens. And your boss becomes a problem. Year in, year out, year in, year out. Until you leave the course of what God has designed. And every time you're looking at what your boss is doing to you, it's your prayer request. My boss is doing this. My boss, oh, you've lost. You've lost the course. He said, look straight. Look before you. Look at the future and where you're going. This is inconsequential. Oh, you've been diagnosed with HIV. So what? I don't believe that any disease can kill me before the fulfillment of my assignment on the earth. But the doctors can tell you about this kind of disease. You cannot live longer. Cancer is incurable. It's stage four, darling. Prepare your house. You're going. And then instead of keeping your vision on what God has placed on your life, you turn your eyes and start attending to this that is killing you. You start putting your house in order. Yet God is saying, I'm not even there. I'm here. You have refused to look right on. To let your eyelids look straight before thee. You are diverted by the circumstances. You're diverted by your landlord issues. You're diverted by your, your, your baby mama issues. You're, you're diverted by your, your weaknesses. You're diverted by all of that nonsense. Listen, it doesn't matter what is happening in your life. Just keep your course. Yes, I know I'm 62 and I've not yet built. But the Bible says that there are houses I have not built, I must enter. Vineyards that I must eat of that I've not planted. That does not take away the word of God. That it doesn't matter how this will come. I have to inherit whatever God has said on my life. Keep your eyes on course. You get what I'm trying to tell you? Things might come and stagger you. But God is looking for a person who says, I'm coming from X, I'm going to Y. They're hitting you, but you're on one course. Like, poo -poo 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 -poo. But where are you? Are you hearing me? Where, that is why I can't answer a social comment. You can't find, do I have a Facebook page? If you find a Facebook page in my name, it's not mine. I have no time for detractors. I'm so busy with God that I don't have an Instagram. I don't even know how to operate X. Recently, I was just learning how Skype works. I'm struggling. Even Zoom, I, pre I press some buttons I'm not supposed to press. Because I don't have time. I don't have time. But to, this, to, to answer YouTube, I beg a grace. Look at where you're going. The people attacking you can't do, even if they removed you and they put them here, they can't do what you're doing. If, they, if, they, if you removed me and put them here, they can't. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Tell your neighbor, fix your eyes on where you're going. Now you understand what the Bible says. Looking unto Jesus. Let's go back to that, prof that, 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 that portion of scripture. Aha! It has come back. He said, keep your eyes on who both began and wait. He finished the rest we are in. He finished the rest we are in. So that means if I'm to look at him, I don't look at him on the track. I look at him on the finish line. Hey! Touch three people and tell them I will finish well. In spite of the circumstances. I know where I'm looking. You may sit down for a few minutes. Do you get it? Hey, hey. You're here thinking that renting is your destiny. Hey, hey. You think they're going to divorce you. You think after your madness, there is no life after that. No, God can start here and reconstruct you. <laughs> God can start from your madness 
and build a story. Do you get what I'm trying to tell you? Joyce Meyer carried a reproach at a young age. Her father took her in his bed and started raping his daughter every day. Imagine the shame and reproach she carries. After all of that, God said, Joyce, let's start. Do you understand what I'm saying? Some of you here, if we are to rewind back seven years ago, you'd be somewhere in governor's. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Some of you were the maddest things the world has ever seen. But God has his heart on you. He had his mind on you. You didn't escape him. Now you're here in service. Come on now. Do you get what I'm trying to tell you? Do you understand what I'm saying? They, they, you wake up and you don't even know where you were last night. You were last night. But look at you preaching the gospel. You're the one now telling people that Jesus is Lord and is alive. Tell your neighbor I will finish. Looking unto Jesus, which is the author. Don't judge people on their journey. Some of the people you're judging tomorrow are going to be the apostles. You, you continue. <laughs> Some of the people we are writing off tomorrow are going to be our instructors. Because you might be done with them, but God is not. God is not. Hey, that's God. Get used to him. Are you following what I'm saying? So, don't be branded by what Christ has not spoken at your end. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. When you begin from his end, you can't sound poor. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12 too. Listen. Who both began and finished this race we are in. Study how he did it. How did he do it? He never lost sight of where he headed. He never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He put up with anything along the way, cross, shame, whatever. Now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. And God says, copy the exact story. You might fall along the way, mess up, be ashamed, have issues, what, be broke. Yeah, keep your eyes. That's what was trying to tell the children of Israel. You've taken your eyes off me. You're looking at manna, you're looking at the rod. You're, okay, let me send some serpents. The serpents start biting. Pa, pa, pa. They go to Moses. What do we do? I'm trying to teach them one lesson. To only look at one thing, put up that snake. That brazen snake on the pole. Whoever will look at it shall live. And they all started looking. And the Bible says, and every man that looked at that serpent lived. Verses 9. He lived. And when they realized what God was trying to tell them, verses 10, the children of Israel set forward. <laughs> you got it? The children of Israel realized what he was trying to tell them. I'm just trying to get you fixed on one attention. One focus point. Christ. Christ. Stay on course. When I start, I, so I tell people, I live my life from the end. And I come back for my remains. You get it? If I feel pain, I don't say, oh, I'm sick. No, I come back to the finished work for he was wounded for my transgressions. By his stripes, I was healed. First Peter 24. And then I come back for my remains and tell them, you belong there. 
You get my point? I begin from wealth to deal with any financial issue. I deal with victory to deal with the madness disturbing me. Begin from the perfect. Get to your feet. Now, I want you to take a few minutes and express yourself in the Holy Ghost. Uganda is in trouble. The nation you're in, wherever you are, is already in trouble. Because the devil now has realized who you... I mean, he, he understands who you are. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Open your mouth and just speak. Thank God for your word. Thank him for his word. Thank him. Speak in other tongues. If you can't speak in tongues, just express your gratitude to God and speak into the things that have been troubling you. Say, I refuse to recognize your sickness. I refuse to recognize your poverty. I refuse to recognize struggle. I refuse to recognize that rent. I refuse to recognize uh, the, the, the wickedness, the scandals, the words spoken. I refuse. I choose to look unto Jesus. Fix my eyes where he is. Right as we are praying if you're there and you've never given your life to christ and you say today i want to receive jesus as my lord and savior also you walk here if you're in this auditorium or in your you're in a tent white tent outside or you're on television you can raise your hand wherever you are if you're there and you say i want to be born again today i want to have a relationship with jesus christ as we are praying together i want you as well to come in front here and i pray with you somebody somebody create somebody build if you want to be born again come erado bazambra katala payala ropa zombra katele paya de zombre ketele pa roba da zombre ketele paya talapa come on create refuse 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 witness refuse refuse sickness refuse struggle ikapata la parade prade gatala parada bagore bada look up to jesus erikando zebra rega zombre ketele pa the son of god must be lifted up he must be lifted up he must be lifted up what jesus is saying is what is true if you want to be born again come and we pray come quickly come quickly if you want to give your life to jesus come come as the rest of us pray if you're in the tent come here come inside the building look and leave Look to Jesus now and leave his record and his word. Hallelujah. It's only that you look and leave. Look and leave. Hey, my brother. For everybody, look to Jesus now. This record and in His word, Hallelujah. Look and leave. I rather leave. What do you see? What do you see? What do you see? Song.
me that you look at me. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. It's your grace is enough for me. Hey, come on, sing it. It's your grace. to accomplishment because he already ran it for you and now you run it through him i decree that your end is wonderful great are your days oh my god god opens your eyes to see what you must see Alicia, come. I want to lay hands on you. Riba zambra gata la payade. Ropa zombre ketetele payada de bazo. Riba zombre ketele payala de gazombre ketele pa. Reba de de. Put up your hands. Kibra re gata dalaba. Receive the anointing. Oh my God. Mate bro robo zigara pa. Ratati lambrande go zigara raba. Receive the anointing. Ripando zibra de gazan kata la pala de de bo. You will finish well. You will finish strong. You have overcome by Christ. Greater days are ahead of you. The worst has already happened. The best is yet to come. You're doing big for God. Your heart is enlarged. Your vision is big. Your hearing is accelerated. Supernatural speed and momentum are yours. I see the redemption of time, the redemption of years. God redefines you. His vision bring, comes with clarity and you will not fail. If you've received it all, shout Amen. Shout Amen. Shout Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Just give me a few minutes and we leave these ones to Christ. I see some people from Chikoni. I'm going to ask Beatrice Buxton, can you go and attend to those ones? The rest of you, just repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you. Say, I thank you because you died for my sins and you were raised for my glory. Today, I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm born again. Amen. Put up your hands. I speak peace over you, victory over you, love over you, progress over you, increase over you, in the mighty name of Jesus, this lady with a white dress, you know, with a white bag, God is delivering you now. 
whatever bondage you've been dealing with you are free in the mighty name of jesus christ young lady in a white yeah god is doing something in your life he's going to use you mightily receive the anointing of the holy ghost god is going to take you places i see you preaching nations i see you heal this God is going to help you. Heavenly Father, I thank you. Go! You spirit of darkness. God is going to help you. God is going to help you. Young man, put up your hands. Yes. Heavenly Father, I hear the spirit of God tell me he's rebuilding. He's rebuilding. Receive the anointing that rebuilds your life. Whatever was broken in your life, God is going to restore. Power of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Those who are slain, leave them there. When they get up, they will go. For those you can take them for their names. Carry somebody on, on Thursday. Carry somebody on Thursday. What a wonderful Palm Sunday. What a wonderful Palm Sunday. Carry one person on Thursday. Carry one person on Thursday. One person. Who's going to do that? I pray for you that may God give you grace and remind you and that whatever I receive on that altar as I preach the gospel, you partake in the same grace. In Jesus' name, see you. This broadcast was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, please visit our website at www.fenero.org or download the Fenero app to stay up to date with all the ministry programs. The Fenero app is available on both Google Play and Apple App Store. Join our online family, spread the love and follow us on Instagram, Facebook and also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Panero, make manifest.